All right. First of all, thank you very much for having me here, and thank you for the audience to uh, coming, showing up in such large number. Um, really appreciate it. I think we have an important story to tell here today, and uh, you have heard the previous speakers that we're actually moving in this direction of, of making fashion sustainable. Uh, we have heard today quite a lot of uh, loom and gloom around this, uh, 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 around the environmental issues. Um, I will actually tell you a positive story. I believe that as, as mankind, what we have proven to ourselves is that we can actually make a change and we can solve these problems. The, the technologies are there. Uh, we need to implement them and we need to implement them fast. Um, but unfortunately, I need to start with two uh, slides which are still on the loom and gloom. But I'll tell you a, a story later on which actually show how to solve that. Um, most of you probably don't know what this is. Uh, this is a lake. This is the Arrow Lake, uh, or what, what was the Arrow Lake, the fourth largest uh, freshwater deposit in the world. It's today called the Aralcon Desert, and it's considered to being the, the largest environmental disaster ever happened. So then, of course, we ask ourselves, what happened here? Well, cotton industry happened here. So what have happened is that uh, they have drained the whole Aral Sea to uh, feed and, and, and use the water for cotton agriculture. Um, to, and what, in addition, what have happened is that you have changed the climate, the microclimate, so this sea will not grow back. It's gone. This is, this is plastic, this is polyester. Polyester is a fantastic plastic in many ways. However, it actually, when we, when we do wash it, and we wash our polyester clothes, we create microfibers. 35% of the microfibers in the seas are coming from polyester. Um, we can find polyester in almost all fishes out in the sea. And uh, the problem is that once we have created the microplastics, they are extremely hard to get out of the, of the ecological systems. The large plastics, we can of course do something with, we can collect them. But the microplastics are almost impossible to get, uh, to get out. So these things actually feels very, uh, you almost get aggravated when you see these problems that you have. Um, on top of that, we have a growth of population in the middle class from 3.4, 3.3 billion people today, up until 2030, it's going to be 5.5. So that means that we're going to have 1.7 billion more people coming into middle class. And for those who read your Maslow's, first you have security, then you have food, and thirdly, you have clothing and shelter. So of course, all those 1.7 billion people would like to clothe themselves within the next 10 years. 1.7 billion people, just to put that in perspective, that's a, an, an India plus a United States population. So it's massive amounts of people that want to clothe themselves going forward. So what we see here on the blue, the blue part, the blue pie chart there is, is cotton. Cotton is, is, is actually going to reduce in amount, in total amount. And reason is that there is not enough space on the planet to grow cotton. Um, that is going to be replaced by viscose, which is the orange uh, pie, and uh, also with polyester. And polyester is grown from 62% to 70%. So we have a huge, monumental task that we need to, take to, to, to solve as we go forward in order to, to, to create clothes for all those middle class. Awareness is rising, but solutions are lacking. Well, what we see is that if you look at, at, at Vogue, ID, they're putting Greta on, on the front of their magazines. That means that the fashion industry, they are seeing this. This needs to happen. They are, they are looking desperately for, for, for solutions. Uh, we heard Jeffrey just, just a minute ago. They are doing great in order to try to solve a lot of these problems. But on a massive scale, we don't have the solutions yet. One of the solutions that we talk when we talk cotton is actually putting it into, shred it and put it into isolations. Uh, well, that's a very, very small number. 
What we do, oops, let's see if it starts. So what we do, we actually take used fabrics, used cotton, and we shred it into small pieces and we put it into a pulp and paper type of process. We create dissolving pulp out of that and then we can actually sell that and our customers are doing yarns out of it and then you can sew new clothes. This process, when we then, we can also recycle uh, the circulose, which is basically a viscose type product we can circulate that over and over again uh, without actually having problems with, with uh, uh, cutting the molecules. So we can actually create what we have been able to do over time uh, with this company is that we can now make the textile industry circular. However, we're small still, but we're going to try to solve that by, uh, by making more and more investments. So, circulose, which is a vis viscous type of material. It's climate positive. Um, we did uh, a life cycle analysis, or we didn't do it, Stella McCartney did, and we had a chance to, to join it. It was uh, uh, SCS who made it, actually. Um, they show that we have a CO2 impact, which is actually negative, meaning we're taking out two, uh, two kilos of carbon dioxide for every kilo of, of circulose that we make. Um, we don't use any virgin resources like, like cotton fibers, or agriculture and cotton fibers. We use what has once been produced. Um, we don't use any water irrigation, uh, no uh, fertilizers or pesticides, of course, and we don't use any land. Uh, and we need the land for the planet going forward in order to feed our populations. And we don't have any habitat destructions either or we don't have the microplastics. We do have microfibers, however, those are cellulosic and they break down in approximately six months. So, we have a scalable technology. We have already built a plant up in Kristinehamn in Sweden, and that plant is up and running, and we are uh, having it now, you know, over about a year, and we're producing in, in, the, in the amounts of, of, of hundreds of metrics tons every year of this even up to 7,000 metric tons by the end of this year. And we are preparing to build an additional full-scale plant. Um, just a few days ago, uh, we launched together with H&M uh, the first uh, collection of, of uh, uh, garments coming out in stores by the 26th of March. On a global scale, it's going to be approximately 100 stores around the globe with this material. Um, it's, we're taking is, is old genes that we actually processed and we have made uh, new uh, dresses out of that uh, and other garments coming out too. So that is just one of the first launches that we're going to have this year and then going forward you're going to see I think approximately three more launches uh, with, with different brands uh, over the year to come. So. Our goal is by 2025 to recycle 1 billion garments. That means approximately 250,000 metric tons capacity, and we are starting to, to build on that capacity. So the short-term uh, goal here is by 2021 have uh, 60,000 metric tons available. Uh, we are actually looking at uh, some sites even here in Germany. So I'm um, really happy to be here to talk to, to you about this. We have this empty site here in Berlin. I mean, they try to make it into something else, but maybe it would fit your needs. <laughs> exactly. We've invested exactly. quite a lot of money into it, so, you and know, Germany, maybe Germany's we could a very, very good cradle place to, to be. cradle it. <laughs> yeah. I actually lived in Germany for a while, so I'd be happy to, to come back here with some investments. Uh, we have... Uh, we have So by 2025, we said uh, 250,000 metric tons, that meaning approximately 1 billion garments. Uh, and by uh, long-term goal is by 2030 to have 1 million tons. And then I need you to remember the other slide that I showed you. This slide. One 
million tons for us is a large, large operation. This means that we will not even make a dent on the growth. We will actually own, we will be less than 1% of the total textile industry. Um, so what we're looking for is actually competition. We're looking for uh, friends in this space <clears throat> to do pretty much the same. Um, and uh, we're also looking for, for, for people to help us to, to grow this and to, to save the planet in this, in this small space, of course. So that was pretty much our story so far. And um, thank you very much for listening. And I'll be happy to, to take any questions from the moderator. And Thank you very much for being here. And thank you very much for creating this company, basically, and for having this whole thing. For me, a question is, we keep talking about you know, how difficult it is. You need pure nylon to recycle nylon. Cotton products, is it the same problem you're face it, facing? Is it 100% cotton only? You have stupid little things like in a cotton t-shirt, you will have a polyester tag in the back. How, how do you deal with that? Is that easier in your field or worse? We can actually handle, uh, right now, we, we, we go for lowest hanging fruit. We take in 95 to 98% uh, cotton. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> However, we have technologies already patented where we can actually lower it down to, let's say, 90%. That means that we can have a mix of 80 to 98% of, of, of cotton. Um, but what, you, what you're talking about here is a very important point. You're touching something super important, and I think in order for us to become uh, circular, we need to start design for circularity. And that means also for the fashion industry. I mean, uh, Jeffrey talked about it. We cannot have nylon threads on our jeans. Uh, we need uh, stretch jeans, you know, having, having um, elastan in it, uh, all other type of, of, of problems is, is created down the line, and we cannot uh, recycle it as it should. So I think uh, design for circularity is very important for the fashion industry and textile industry itself, but I think that actually goes for the whole cradle-to-cradle -cradle mentality. Um, and, and, and also, uh, we talked earlier about what is cradle-to-cradle. -cradle. For me, it's quite, quite easy. It is about that you can actually uh, regenerate what you have once already produced, and that we can use the resources, the virgin resources, should not be uh, put into landfill or burnt like it's being with, with textile today. Less than 1% is being going into, into second hand or, or, or regenerated. All virgin resources like oil or, or, or cotton or what have you, they need to find a circular way. Otherwise, it's, uh, we, we, we will not be able to feed our planet. I mean, look at the, uh, the, the food. Uh, I mean, we have problems already. Mm -hmm. And on top of that, we're also going to see the building industry. Um, the building industry is going to need forests in order to build it. Uh, you're going to have it for, for jet fuels. I mean, it, the, the resources on this planet, we need to start taking care of what we have once produced and create that circularity. I would like to open the field, and we have a question down here. Again, Axel Dick from Austria. How do you organize the collection of your raw material? Because normally it's thrown to the household waste. Exactly. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, uh, right now, we don't have a problem at all when it comes to, to collection. There's an abundance of, of, of cotton, and we normally buy it from three sources. It's <clears throat> It's post-consumer, so from the collectors, and it normally trickles down. And here in Germany, you have a lot of very, very good collection of, 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 of textiles. Maybe you don't know, but you're probably one of the best countries in the world for that. Um, the, the other area is, uh, is uh, 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 post-production, so clippings. Uh, that is a very, very good area where we get a lot of raw materials. And the last is unsold goods from the brands. So we'd collect from all three of those. And uh, of course, if we can have uh, raw materials which are designed for circularity, then that, that creates even easier ways for us to, to, uh, to solve that problem. 
I didn't know that, that we were so good in Germany. I always thought we were really bad at the whole, you know, fashion collecting mm. Which thing. is the most important source at the moment? Hmm, I, uh, may I pass on that, please? Because we, we, try, we try to keep our sources when to, uh, to ourselves at the moment. Um, it's okay. Uh, please, if that's okay. Yeah, <laughs> I think that's totally okay. <laughs> Thank you. Do we, is this what it feels like? Yeah. Or the fabric? Yeah. So it basically also feels exactly like cotton. That would, it does. to me, it's, it does. I mean, it basically has all the, all the good things that cotton has. It like does. from, I don't know, moisture absor observation to, I don't know what. We're actually making different type of garments at the moment so that when we go on the fashion shows next, we will have different type of garments. So we have, we have made jeans. Uh, we have made uh, t-shirts, uh, we have made uh, jerseys, uh, and we're going to continue doing, uh, as you probably know, uh, the fashion industry and, and the textile industry, they have different ways of, of, of weaving and different ways of, of making the threads and so forth, so you can get all different kind of, of um, uh, properties uh, on, your, on, 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 on your textile. Yeah. Yeah. And it feels like cotton. But we can also, on that type of material, we can also make something that's very, very uh, glittery, like like this, for example. This is probably this is probably polyester. I think nah, I've been wearing I it for years viscose. because I, I feel so bad that <laughs> yeah, I, I have think that's it in my viscose, closet. Actually. No, it's good. <laughs> it's uh, but I'm upcycling. It's yeah. been I think it's at least that's ten good. years old. Yeah, it's beautiful. <laughs> no, no, it's fine. That could go, that could go um, all the way. <laughs> no, 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 it's totally fine. Um, to me, the, the other question is, I was just at the ISPO, and I was actually working with a lot of the outdoor brands, and I think what is so interesting there is that you do see the trend in the segments, um, especially in like sporting goods, that they're trying to really get back. They're trying to make simple things that you can upcycle. They said one of the biggest problems is colorings. So is that also a problem for your cotton recycling? Because, I mean, they, I think Adidas had a jacket. Mm. But it's white. You can't really, they haven't found a way to do it in a different color yet. Do you have a problem with my black or red t shirt? Not really, no. Okay. We, we are decoloring it. We're actually bleaching it and uh, does throughout that work our process. Through chemicals? Or like yeah, it's, it's a type of, if you t take a, a pulp and paper type of process, that's how you bleach it, and the, uh, the chemicals are being reacted. Um, and uh, on that note, I mean, we, we hardly get any chemicals out. If you look at, um, the, the, the pulp and paper industry is very, very strong in Sweden, and that's why we probably are in Sweden. We have a very strong academia uh, in Sweden in, the, uh, in this space. Um, but the, the pulp and paper industry is closed loops. Mm -hmm. they, don't, they hardly use anything. They actually generate energy. Uh, so, uh, and, and we're using similar type of, 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 of chemicals and, and, and processes, actually. So in the end, it's a, it's a pretty white product. It looks like this, uh, and you're selling it in, in big sheets. Uh, and it's an it's a industry standard already. So we're actually tapping right into an existing value chain. So our customers, they don't need to change. They don't change the machinery. They change the processing a little bit, I guess. But you know, they're just tapping right in, which is, is I think it's very important that um, our our customers and also the brands, they don't have to change uh, the way they manufacture the clothes and they know what kind of fibers they have and, and what the fibers do, etc. So uh, that means that we can actually expand uh, this whole thing very fast. And uh, you know, we, we have contact with approximately 60 brands. And we're a small company up in cold Sweden, Stockholm, you know, and, uh, but they call us. And that, I find it amazing. And I must say that the fashion industry is really, really trying to find the solutions. And I, I feel almost sorry for, for the fact because they're looking for and trying, but there are no solutions. And what we're trying to provide is the solution or one of the solutions. So um, um, we're looking forward to actually expanding this and, and building these plants to become you know, industrial relevant. Mm -hmm. I think we have a question from the audience. Yeah. Hey, um, my question might be a little bit provocative, but I hope you Please. still answer it. <laughs> um, so you mentioned that you work together with H&M, and as probably most of us know, H&M is one of the uh, biggest brands in the fashion industry, and they're also fast fashion industry. So how do you justify working together with a brand that basically um, doesn't pay the workers minimum wage, 
Um, I think most of us know about the movement like fashion revolution, um, fabrics hmm. end up in, in landfills still. So how do you justify that, that you're working together with a company that is basically still just greenwashing their customers in order to sell more products? Hmm. And in my opinion, the solution is already there. Like, we don't need more clothes. There's already enough on the planet. We just need to, like, recycle it better and also buy secondhand and shop less. And we need a company like this to put all the... I, I have two answers to that. <laughs> two answers. One is, one is uh, I don't agree with you that uh, you shouldn't work with somebody like, like H&M. They are one of the best promo pro promoters in order to, to make a, uh, a sustainable world. Uh, uh, if we can actually tap into their uh, customer base, let's say, and we can actually get customers, you out there, to accept circulos and other type of recycling technologies, then we will be able to save the planet. So that's one. I think we need, I need to work with all the brands to trying to help them to solve the problems. But I give you uh, the, the point uh, that we should use the clothes more. We, our motto uh, within um, uh, Renew Sellers, uh, which is our company, is uh, use and use it for long. Reuse, so meaning actually re uh, second hand or so, uh, but also recycle. If we can do those three, we can, we can solve a lot of problems in, in the fashion industry and in the textile industry. The other point I wanted to make is um, if, we, if we think that we can actually change the world by asking people to use, let's say, uh, clothes looking ugly, uh, itching, uh, uh, things they cannot use, etc., cetera, then, we, then I think we, we, we're making a mistake in our thought process because we as humans, we, we of course talk with words. We talk with our body language, but all of you in here, you talk with what you put on this morning. You talk, you actually communicate gender, social status, nationality, and God knows what else. You know, we communicate with the way we dress if we go to parties, if we are lecturing, if we're going to work. So having, you know, nine billion people on this planet, or seven, whatever we are now, to, to actually stop communicating, I don't think that will work. I think we need to find ways where people can dress themselves, but dress themselves more consciously with those three, use, reuse, and, and recycle, and uh, continue expressing themselves and talk, I mean, communicate as we have. Otherwise, we're going we're gonna to be struggling and trying to change people's minds. You know, in, we, we're going to work on this for 30, 50, 100 years. I want change, but I want it now. I, I don't want to wait. I don't want to wait for all of us to start acting differently. If we can implement these type of technologies, we can make it happen within five to 10 years. 30. <laughs> You said before what I thought was interesting that, you know, even if you reach your goal in 230, was it with how much? With one... One million tons. With one million tons, it's only one percent. Mm. Is there already enough, or are there numbers, is there enough cotton clothing out there that we could go into a loop? Yeah, there is. I mean, if you take all, let's say, theoretically, this yeah. is Ethiopia, okay? Totally. I'm, I'm just, <laughs> okay. that's what I'm... I'm Take one, one fourth, let's say one fourth of the whole, the whole cake mm -hmm. was, is cotton. Mm -hmm. Let's say that we take that and we make that into viscose that we can recycle in, in our type of process. Then it takes four years in order for us to make the whole cake. Okay. So the idea is, of course, grow cotton, get it into the loop, recycle it, and keep it recycling, and then just feed it in. And within four years, we could do that. That will not happen, but we can actually continue and, and, and using what we once already produced with this type of technology. And that's kind of our point. We need to be able to, we cannot have virgin resources put on landfills. We have to use what we once produced. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much for being here. Thank you. And um, I wish you all the growth in the world, actually. <laughs> I, hope, um, I hope that you find a lot of partners out there and that this becomes you know, one of the technologies of the future. Thank you, everyone, for listening.